I feel a song coming on. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Lee Waters. I'm director of the Institute of Welsh Affairs, and we are an independent think tank. Uh, and I'm chairing uh, the final session, uh, which is imaginatively called Question Time. Uh, the panel before you, I don't know if you have biogs in your packs, um, but let's, let me assume that you don't. And uh, so I'll very quickly introduce them. Uh, on the far right is, or your far left, is uh, Alan Davis, the former. Minister for Natural Resources and as Labour Assembly Member for Blaine Gwent. Uh, then we have Anthony Slaughter, who is the Deputy Leader of the Green Party in Wales. Uh, then we have Heer Hughes Griffiths, who is the Applied Cymru Spokesperson on Energy and Assembly Member for North Wales. And Bill Powell, the Liberal Democrat Assembly Member for Mid Wales. Uh, unfortunately, despite uh, strenuous efforts by Renewable UK, the Conservatives were not able to provide someone to take part this afternoon, which is not a terribly encouraging sign. Uh, I don't think. Um, and UKIP have missed their train, which I think is some kind of <laughs> tortured metaphor. <laughs> I'll let that one hang, I think. Uh, now, the, uh, the, the BT servers have been going overtime today with all the uh, tweets suggesting questions. Uh, we've had two. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to capture the energy in the room after a a full day of uh, what I'm told has been a stimulating uh, discussion. There'll be lots uh, to ask uh, the panel. Um, so perhaps I'll uh, start off um, by just giving each of you a couple of minutes to uh, make an opening statement and perhaps uh, frame it like this. What do you think the election result means for the future of renewables uh, in Wales and in the UK more broadly? And, and Alan, perhaps I'll... Uh, Start with you, being as you've got your clever glasses on. We can expect <laughs> profound thoughts. Well, it means I can see you, at least. Uh, do you know, the, look, put, put aside the fact that I find the election result the most depressing things that's uh, uh, happened for, for quite some time. I'm concerned about a number of different areas where I simply don't think the Tories give a damn. I don't think they particularly give a damn about us here in Wales. Um, despite uh, Cameron's impressively early visit to a brewery in the Gower, I'm not convinced that they thought, they thought out where Wales sits in the United Kingdom. You know, they, they've got far more ideas about the devolution to cities in Northern England than they have to us. Now, I support what they're doing in England. I think it's a good thing. And I, I'd like to see, see more of that. But I, I am concerned that they don't know how we sit and where we sit in that overall um, programme of things. And in terms of energy, you know, I, in government, attended uh, UN climate change conferences with the then coalition government. And to be fair to Ed Davey, I thought he did a really impressive job speaking up for um, uh, the forces of, of, of righteousness. But, you know, he was, you know, he didn't suffer from a sort of Stockholm syndrome affair, but he was very much, you know, a creature of a coalition. And the coalition... 
uh, I heard ministers, uh, Owen Patterson is the obvious example, tell me in Brussels, in, 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 in council of ministers meetings, that he didn't, he didn't believe that climate change was happening and that none of these issues that we were discussing were a priority for him. And my feeling is that Owen is closer to the center of gravity of this government than Ed would have been. And as a consequence of that, I, I, I don't see that the, the new UK government see uh, renewables and see a clean uh, energy policy as being anywhere close to the top of their priorities. I see them uh, looking hard at how they can manage um, <coughs> the political difficulties around Paris and the rest of it, but I don't see them coming up with innovative, fresh ideas for how we can make renewables the norm and not the exception. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I, I feel that we're in a very, very difficult situation in Wales. I don't think the St. David's process, it wasn't an agreement, it was a process, it was a, 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 a statement from a Conservative Party in government, um, pays enough attention to providing Wales with the freedoms and the headroom that we need to design our own policies in the way that we need to design them. So I, I've got very real concerns about all of that. I can't blame you for having a free hit because there's no Tories here to defend themselves, but let me just try and put the, the case for them. So the, a number of influential Green commentators have said that Amber Rudd is good news. She is personally committed to climate change. She was the junior minister. She's supportive of the tidal lagoon, not keen on onshore wind uh, or solar farms, but generally gets it and will do good things. And you're in government in Wales. You were obviously... A, minister who is well regarded, but the government as a whole doesn't have a great reputation for following through the rhetoric with, with action. And there are lots of schemes in the pipelines. There's very encouraging words in strategies, but in terms of potential realised, perhaps you should look in the mirror before casting aspersions on the Tories. I, I don't think that's an entirely unfair criticism. Uh, in terms of, of, of uh, Amber, I, I agree with you personally. I, I don't know issue with Amber. I simply don't think she's going to be at the centre of government. You know, Owen forced himself into a centre of government simply because of the politics of a Conservative Party at the time, and he spent a lot more time in Number 10 than I think Amber will. And uh, as a consequence, I simply don't see the politics being there in order to push this agenda forward. And that's not a, a reflection on her as an individual or on her as a minister. It's a reflection on where the politics of a Conservative Party are. In terms of the, the, the Labour government here in Cardiff, as I said, I, I think some of your criticisms are, are fair and valid, and I say that as, as a former minister responsible for these, uh, the, these matters. You know, with some very good officials, a couple with us this afternoon. I can see, see you there, don't worry. Uh, but I, I think there has been a lack of clarity in terms of setting objectives and setting timelines and setting very, very clear ambition, ambitious targets for where we want to be. You know, um, one of the things I tried to do in government wasn't simply to issue sta uh, statements and strategies, but, you know, I, I'm sure there's somebody, I hope there's somebody here who remembers this. I did publish a statement uh, a year last September saying, in the following year, we will have done the following, and we will have achieved the following. Uh, very, very clear in order to set that target, set targets and set directions and deadlines. And I think in Wales, we're better at strategies than we are at targets, and we're better at talking than we are at achieving those targets. And I think if there's one thing that I would say to um, people writing the Labour Manifesto for next, uh, for next spring, don't just put a lot of soap in that manifesto, a lot of rhetoric. Use the word sustainability as often as possible. Put numbers into that manifesto. We will deliver the following by the following timescale at the following date hard targets we, where we can be held to account for what we do or don't do. Okay, there's lots there you can come back on, but let's, let's give everybody in the panel a chance to have their say. So, Anthony, Anthony Slaughter, your reflections on the, the election result and its meaning. Um, when I was talking to the organisers about this a few months ago, it seemed like a really exciting prospect because we'd probably be in the middle of all sorts of interesting negotiations right now. Who's talking to who and how are we going to get this through? <laughs> And then on the night of the count, you know, talking to colleagues in Clyde and Lib Dems, and, well, no one's talking to us now. But in terms of where these renewables... I'm still talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> there go my poll ratings. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what Karen told me. <laughs> in terms of renewables, I think there's some 
Mixed messages. Over a million people voted for the Green Party. So there are people out there who want this message, who, who get the message. The key thing that we take away from is the unfair voting system. It is broken beyond repair now, and it is indefensible. And that's something I'd like to see in the Labour manifesto, is joining together with other parties. And you're probably right, actually. And arguing for a fair voting system. It's the only way we're going to make progress on these issues. Because, as I said, we've got over a million votes, but it was a campaign based on fear and hate whereas we offer a campaign of hope and the future, a vision for the future. And there was hate peddling from both sides. You vote for X, you'll get Y, vote for Y, you'll get X plus Z. So I, did have pe I had people who'd been loyally putting up Green Party boards year in, year out, having said, sorry, Anthony, it's between the big two this time. So that underlines how it needs to be fixed. But also I think this majority Tory government, which I'm as depressed as probably most people in this room are, and it's a shame they're not here to defend themselves, they've got a very narrow majority, and I think there's also, it's touched on in some of the earlier sessions, it could in a way focus our minds, rather than sort of lots of ongoing coalition discussions and lots of fudge, we've got a clear picture now of what's on the table, and the case that we need to make needs to be made even more stronger. And yeah, there are some good things. I mean, Amber Rudd isn't as bad as it could have been, but I think fracking is going to be the first hurdle that they fall down on. So it's not the result that most people in this room wanted, but it should focus us. And like I say, the priority for us is getting a fair voting system so that people can get the governments that they vote for. Here, I guess, there's a, there's, isn't there a danger this becomes an anti-Tory issue? And if you're going to influence the government, that's not going to get much traction, is it? What's, what do you think can be the response of people who are in favour of renewables to, to the election result, and how can they mobilise change? Well, if I could answer that question, I'm not sure if I'd be sitting here today. I'd probably be <laughs> developing my own business, to be honest. But uh, I, I, I think is right. The danger is now, uh, and we're already seeing it, I think, is that the, the, the new government is going to see Wales as very much at the margins and quite irrelevant in terms of uh, its priorities over the next sort of... Uh, mm. Uh, number of years and you know I would say as we did throughout the campaign you know had we made them sit up and listening uh, and listen as the Scottish did with with you know the, the huge vote for the SNP then things might have been different um, so despite Labour saying that they'd be standing up for Wales I'm afraid that even Labour now are not going to be in a position where uh, you know we're going to be able to do that so we're very much at the mercy of this uh, Tory government now for me that focuses the mind in terms of maximizing the powers that we can ensure that are devolved to Wales so that we can actually take control of as much of our own uh, destiny as, as possible uh, in the face of that threat, but particularly in relation to uh, renewable energy. I think uh, the point made about fracking, we're going to see a huge ramping up of that narrative and financial support for fracking, uh, likewise with nuclear, uh, and of course that means sucking out resources from other potential uh, energy uh, investments, which is bad news for, for all of us in the room here today, I, I presume. So it doesn't all go too well. Um, and. You know, a fortnight after that election, we're awaiting the Queen's speech, of course, you know, and we, we've heard the rumours and we've seen a few lines in manifestos and, you know, if our fears are, are sort of realised, then it's not going to be good. Um, and at this moment in time, I, you know, I don't know if everybody else feels as helpless as I do, but we're very no, much at the mercy of this government. Yeah, well, this is going to be a long hour, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a long five years. Uh. <laughs> Bill Power. Thanks, Lee. It sounds as though we're all, we're all in need of therapy, really. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I think this is it, I, I, Yes. I mean, I must say, I, I, I find it difficult to disagree with pretty much anything that's, that's been said um, so far um, on, on, the, on the panel. I think uh, Alan's analysis of the, of the election result and the fallout is, is, is pretty much spot on. I mean, the, Jeff Lean, the environment editor of the, of the Telegraph, a relatively enlightened um, uh, journalist for that particular newspaper said that Amber Rudd, uh, at least she isn't a headbanger, uh, and, and that's true, but nevertheless, uh, she is, she is um, associated with this push for fracking, uh, which, is, which is enormously damaging, potentially, and I think that's one of the serious threats that, that we face. Um, earlier this week, I, uh, I'm not going to say celebrated, I marked a, a round birthday, uh, 1965 was the year I was born, and, and, and in that year, and the, there were events just last weekend around the, the Cambrian Colliery disaster, and I think we, we need to recall the, the costs uh, that people have, have paid over time to secure energy and, and, and power 
this country, and we need to be aware that there are no easy choices. Um, the, the election, clearly, uh, the election result uh, does leave us with a, with a pretty uh, bad taste in, in our mouths, and, uh, and those people who felt it necessary to decry the coalition in lots of respects, and I've had difficulties with a number of aspects of environmental policy and have been clear on issues like the fit, the fit tariffs and, uh, and, the, and the more pragmatic line on, on fracking than, than, than we in, in the Welsh Lib Dems uh, have supported, but people will have cause to, uh, t to note the, the difference between the, the government we've had in the last five years and the red meat eaters that, who are now in charge. I mean, that is absolutely clear. But there, there are opportunities here. We've got uh, the other winners of the election, clearly the SNP, you've got a situation there where, where, where we're going to have significant concessions to, to Scotland, and I think the time is right for Welsh Government, and, and hopefully more than Welsh Government, but also a, a wider uh, coalition of opinion in Cardiff Bay and across Wales to actually push for greater powers, and, and it'll be difficult to argue against that in the context of, of what is going to be on, on offer to Scotland. It's also very uh, depressing uh, that uh, the Green Investment Bank is unlikely to acquire the borrowing powers that uh, would potentially have, have uh, been available to it. And I think that is something that uh, that is a matter of regret also. But uh, I hope we'll find some positivity in the next uh, 45, 50 minutes and, uh, and uh, that I'll be able to contribute to that. But those are my initial thoughts. Okay, well, just picking up on that theme, let me pick up one of the avalanche of questions that we had submitted. Um, from Sarah Lewis, who asked, what kind of role do you see for alternative finance and crowdfunding when it comes to powering the renewables revolution? Um, here, alternative finance yeah, and crowdfunding. I think, yeah, crowdfunding is, is sort of uh, one of these things. It's, it's all the rage, apparently, isn't it? And I think it certainly has a role to play, but in, in terms of its significance, you know, we, we need something that's a bit more sort of transitional and a bit more sort of uh, uh, ambitious, I think. Um, we, it, when we're looking at sort of the Queen's speech and these statements about, you know, potentially no more uh, public subsidy for onshore wind, you know, well, that doesn't augur too well. So we've got to look elsewhere. That's, that's, that's clear. Um, but but you, you now control four councils in Wales. Yes. Councils have the power to borrow. Yeah. Borrowing is very, very cheap Absolutely. at the moment. Yeah. We can yeah. effectively yeah. borrow for nothing. Yeah. So you've got a very progressive policy. Why aren't your councillors showing leadership on that and borrowing to release the funds? Well, we have been in control of one of those four uh, for about 20 hours now. So, <laughs> yeah, so no, no, you're right. I mean, there's, there, there's much that can be done. And I think actually direction needs to come strongly from Welsh Government in mm. that respect. You know, maybe we should be telling local authorities that they have a role, you know, a proactive role to play uh, in that respect. We, we saw uh, in my region in, in Wrexham, the work that Wrexham did in terms of solar panels. Yep. Uh, and, you know, that, okay, linked to the fits and everything, but it, it, there was a sort of transitional, sort of attitudinal change uh, amongst a lot of people living in those, some of those housing, uh, social housing in, in Wrexham, where they actually realised, you know, the, the direct tangible benefit to them of having the solar panel on their roof in terms of, of costs, uh, but also in terms of, of, of carbon emissions as well. Um, now, you know, we, we need to look at uh, giving local authorities a more formal role. We, we know of Thamesway Energy, you know, and the work that's happened in Woking. It's quite often held up as an example of what could be emulated elsewhere, and I think, you know, that's a positive. Um, we, we need to look at um, uh, energy services companies, you know, and that model being sort of more proactively encouraged through central government in partnership with local authorities. And, you know, we're looking at local government reorganisation. Well, let's look at it in, in a wider context. And I certainly feel they're in a position to be able to deliver a lot of this on the ground. Uh, and there are examples that we can point to that are, are working and have worked. And, you know, why shouldn't we be uh, a bit more sort of encouraging in, in sort of trying to replicate that? But let me, let me just push you back on that, because rather than saying let's expect the Welsh government to mandate local authorities, you are a, a party yeah. in power. Yeah. You control one-sixth of Welsh councils. You could do something about this, put your money where your mouth is, and, and access the money that is available. But at, at, I, I agree, but at a time when uh, local government reorganisation is in the offing, at a time when all of these pressures around them, they're firefighting day in, day out, I'd forgive all councils for not having prioritised that, um, but because it's not on the radar. In terms of your manifesto for next year, you, that could be one of the things uh, that yeah, you put absolutely, in? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on the panel before I go back to the audience on, on alternative finance and crowdfunding? Uh -huh. Yep, please. In, in, I, I disagree with Lear on this. I, I, I think that 
the, the white paper that Leighton published um, last month, or two months ago actually provides local authorities with the general power of competence, which will, I think, free up some of the legal issues which some local authorities feel that they have in terms of doing this. But fundamentally, uh, and this is why I do disagree with Leah, I think what we, we haven't done is bring together social, economic, and uh, e energy policy with what we're trying to do in terms of alleviating poverty, and we can be doing this. Um, we, you know, I, I wouldn't say Welsh Government doesn't have a role in this, but I, I don't think we can say, it's right to say local government won't do this because Welsh Government isn't doing it first. And well, I, I, well think I, we need to, yeah. I, I think we need to look for a much wider and bigger role for, for local authorities in doing so. The Deep Place study, of course, in Tredega foreshadowed mm -hmm. a lot of, of, of these sorts of, of, of issues. Mm -hmm. But in terms of al alternative finance, yes, if alternative financial uh, options do have their place. But, you know, there's also a place for the major financial houses as well in looking at how we can deliver um, uh, investment in renewables. Uh, you know, one of the things I tried to do in office was to launch a prospectus for green growth, not um, in, in the rather grand room here, but an even grander room in the city of London. And talking to investors in, um, in Mansion House, there was a great desire there for innovative schemes where people felt there was security in order to, m to make those investments. And it's, I think it's an absolute tragedy that we haven't pursued that green growth agenda and that we haven't been more proactive in seeking out financial sources or, or, or of support outside of the traditional forms of government. So why but is that? Gov well, well, that's a, 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 a matter for others. But, it, it, you know, w w what I would like to see us doing is government using the powers it has available to it to underwrite and to support and to provide uh, guarantees which will then de-risk um, investments which will bring in um, funding from outside of public sources. And I think there's great potential there. And what Welsh Government can do, of course, is to bring together a lot of local and smaller schemes in order to act as a single package. So there's a room for the people here who want to unlock the lethargy. So give us some insight of, of what are some of the things that are holding back the Welsh Government in pushing this forward. Because as you say, the investors want security. What are, what are the, some of the, the issues where there's, the, there's a, a, a real blockage that needs to be pushed through? I, I think there's a blockage in the governance of Wales. I don't think it's a matter of Welsh government versus someone else. You know, I'm sure there are people here who've suffered more than I have with the planning system. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are people here who have sought to um, make investments but don't have the ability to either have the grid connections that they require, the technical support that they require, or the access to funding that they require. Now, what government can do is to break down some of those barriers. Now, s some people here will have read the, um, uh, the statement that um, uh, Edwina Hart made in April on some of these issues. It was a good thing, bringing together the energy into a single portfolio. It's a shame they actually haven't done that. Uh, the, the statement said we brought energy together. We haven't. Its uh, energy efficiency still lies with another minister. Yeah. Um, what, what Welsh Government should be doing, in my view, is creating a single department for energy and climate change and ensuring that that department is empowered to actually make significant changes. We just had a planning bill, which is now becoming a planning act, but, you know, I, I asked the minister for two criteria by which I would judge its success. Does it protect the future of the Welsh language, and does it enable the development of smaller-scale renewables across Wales? And those are the criteria against which I think the planning act should be judged, but the Welsh government acting as a... a as, as, uh, as an overarching, if you like, or underpinning, depends on what language you want to use, but certainly delivering the support to enable others to break down the barriers that exist. And I think we can do that. And that's why targets are so important, timescales, targets, deadlines. Okay, I'll come to questions in a minute, so please put your hand up if you have one. But let me just give Anthony a quick chance to add his... It's moved on from where I wanted to comment, but I would comment on, I think what's important is the quality of government at whatever level. So in the Green Party, we believe in devolved power at every level. You know, we want Wales to have devolved power control over its energy policy, but we want that to go further. We want local authorities to have more power over what happens in their areas. And it goes back to saying, why haven't local authorities done this? It's, and it was touched upon earlier today. We can get these powers at every level, but if we don't have the quality, if we don't have the bravery of leadership to actually take those powers and do something with them, 
then we will stay in this stagnant position. It's, we need imaginative and brave leadership at every level. Otherwise, getting those powers devolved won't achieve what we want to achieve anyway. On the original thing of crowdfunding, I mean, that's brilliant for sort of small-scale community schemes, which we're very much in favor. We want to see more and more small-scale generation. But you're not going to be able to crowdfund a tidal lagoon. It needs serious government intervention. OK, Bill, if you forgive me, I'll come back to you. Sorry, I don't want to go across everyone for every question. Um, but I'll come back to you for the next one. So hands up, please, if you have questions. And could you please say who you are? I'm Tim Melville from Lightsource. Um, I was very disappointed from all the parties for not raising the issue of climate change and renewables in the general, general um, elections. And I think, if I may say so, that places guilt upon all of you, upon this Conservative government, who can actually say it wasn't an issue raised at the election, and therefore we can ignore it. Thank you. Any other questions before we go back to the panel? Uh, Becky Muller. I think I'll have a party of Wales hat today. Um, I think if, if um, community renewables were made permitted development within criteria, they might follow the path of PV when that was made permitted development under a applied Labour coalition. So back on the first one, Bill, because before you got into government, climate change was very much something the Lib Dems would bang on about, but mm. there wasn't much mention of it in the election campaign. I think it's fair to say that, uh, that it, it didn't have the attention that it deserved um, in, the, in the campaign just gone. But, but actually, in, in parallel to that campaign, uh, we, within the National Assembly, were at that time working uh, on the Future Generations Bill, now the Future Generations Act, and, and something that we had uh, built into that was the, uh, what was the whole um, agenda of, around climate change and a commitment from Carl Sargent, to be fair to him, which he's now honouring, that that uh, is going to be built into the Environment Bill, which was published um, last Monday. So in terms of what we can do here at a Welsh level, I would argue that we are, we're not doing enough. Absolutely, absolutely clear. But we are, we, are doing, uh, we are doing something, and we need to raise our game. So I accept your point, but, uh, but we, are doing, we, are, we are doing something uh, in that area. And it, but it is one of the, the, the biggest dilemmas that faces us, and, it, and it cl clearly at the moment hasn't received the attention that it, uh, that it deserves. If I could, uh, Lee, return very briefly to the earlier question uh, without uh, going into too much uh, detail on it, and that, and that is with regard to the importance of local government reform, because I think it's really important uh, that that, that uh, local government reform that, that comes out of the process currently underway delivers um, authorities of the appropriate scale, but also with a fair voting system so that we can smoke out once and for all the independents who are an absolute scourge of local <laughs> government in Wales. I mean, sometimes they're, they're cruelly defined as Freemasons, farmers, and fascists who control uh, people, uh, authorities within, Ooh, tweet within, within, within Wales. And, <laughs> and, and I think it's really important that, that they are smoked out once and for all, and a fair voting system will make it impossible for them to sustain the stranglehold that they have on Wales currently in certain of our rural authorities, and that will actually be to the benefit of, uh, of the planning system, but also to the benefit of our uh, climate change agenda. Well, both you and Anthony have eulogised about the potential of local authorities, but there's a room full of people here with experience of dealing Could I just with councils across Wales. Hold on a second. Sorry. I'm finished with question, yeah. Uh, who, who will be not quite so uh, sanguine as you are about the benign power of local authorities in, in, in untapping the potential of renewables? So is this a, is this a, is this a faith that's well-placed? Just by having bigger local authorities and getting rid of some independence, is that really going to make much of a well, difference? I think, I think it'll, make, it'll, it'll make a contribution because it'll bring clarity to the debate uh, that, uh, that takes place at election time. And, uh, and for the reasons that the gentleman in the front row indicated earlier, I think these, these are issues that people are not going to be able to ignore anymore. Before I come to Anthony, I'm just on the Future Generations Bill you mentioned, mm. in terms of practical difference that's going to make, because uh, for me it falls into the category Alan was talking about earlier about, about the, the warm words and the, and the flim flam. Um, you got it, you got it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, you were, you uh, were, <laughs> within the spirit of what you said, for sure. Um, but you, know, you, you, as you said, got the government to strengthen with an explicit commitment to climate change. But in practical terms, in terms of getting applications through and changing on the ground, what difference will that make? Well, uh, that very much is, is, is going to be work through now in the in the environment bill and that is the third and that is the critical piece of legislation that arguably should have come 
before rather than, 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 than where it is in the, in the order. But uh, it's well, going to provide, yeah. it's gonna provide a, 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 a structure within which NRW will have to work. And, uh, and that will advance, I would argue, that would advance the agenda that, you've but that's, of. that's the environment bill, of course. I mean, mm. in terms of the well-being of future generations mm. bill, what it'll do is it'll create 22 public service boards, one for each local authority in Wales. And Alan said earlier, we're very good at attending committees, mm. but how good are we at turning those into tangible differences to mm. people's lives on the ground? Uh, we have local service boards, uh, mm. not the shining beacon of delivery, in my view, no, um, and now we're putting those effectively on statutory footing. Um, so there are huge questions, mm. as far as I'm concerned, about uh, the practical application of the principles that are espoused mm. in the bill, which we all subscribe to, I'm sure, yeah. um, and that's the proof of the pudding, clearly. Uh, I'm yeah. not convinced that delivering those through 22 public service boards is the best way to do it, Clearly, especially with the local government reorganisation in the offing, you know, we might have to start again with six or seven, I'm not sure. Mm. But, but, but there are key issues there. But in terms of climate change, of course, it's the Environment Bill now that will deliver yeah. okay. statutory climate change targets yes. for Wales. Um, and that's a positive that we've been calling for for very many years, and we're glad now at least uh, mm. at last as well that the government are actually doing something about that. Yeah. But the Welsh Government already has climate change targets. It hasn't made much of an impact on, it, on the policies it delivers. Yeah. So why do you think this will be any different? Well, I, well, hopefully it'll focus the mind. Putting it in statute, I think, will underline the priority that should be afforded to it. And hopefully we'll see a government moving away from decisions such as the abhorrent decision that was made by Carl Sargent uh, when he was housing minister, at least responsible for planning, uh, when they reviewed uh, Part L regulations, uh, building regulations, on energy efficiency of houses, the government, the Welsh government, went out to consult on a 25% increase improvement and a 40% improvement, uh, and they decided on an 8% improvement. Now, if that's the level of ambition that this Labour government in Wales has in terms of tackling carbon emissions from uh, new build housing in Wales, then we are in deep, deep trouble because that locks in that inefficiency for the lifetime of that new house, which is, you know, hugely uh, serious because we it'll cost us in the end to retrofit those new houses, you know, a few years down the line. And I think that was a retrograde decision. Uh, we missed out on that first mover advantage in being ahead of the game in Wales because we all have to reach, you know, a certain uh, level uh, by 2020. Uh, England are now ahead of us and Wales once again playing catch up. But the commercial reality is the house builders simply wouldn't play ball on that. They just wouldn't build the houses we needed. But they're doing it in England. Alain, would you like to respond to that? I, I think there was, uh, a, uh, there was a sharp um, brush with reality in terms of, of the politics of, of where the government was at that time. As what Clear forgets is what we're not doing in England is um, passing le legislation on sprinklers as well. And you put those two together and you do create a significant um, additional cost for the provision of new homes. And a decision was taken, rightly or wrongly, um, which, which has been outlined and criticised this afternoon. But, you know, that's where we are, and that was the, the, the decision taken. In terms of taking this forward, because I think you're right, the climate change is not and did not come up at all on the doorstep during the last campaign. And that's not the fault of the population, it's not the fault of the media, it's the fault of politicians. Mm. And one of the questions that we need to answer, and this is for, for politicians, is why have we failed completely to demonstrate the importance of climate change to people in their daily lives? We, we, we've never been able to articulate clearly and in any convincing, convincing fashion the linkages between the big wide issues that will be discussed either <coughs> in Paris or uh, somewhere else in the world and the poverty facing a community in six bells outside Ab uh, Abertillery. We've never done that, and, and we need to be able to do that. And until we are able to do that, it will not become an ele election issue, and it will not become a political priority. For me, uh, if, we, if you look at where we're going to be next May, each political party will do it in their own way, do, do different things. But we have to be very, very clear. We need to say, we've, we, we've been through too many debates on powers and devolution and the rest of it, but we need to be very, very clear. We know what powers are available to us, and we have to be clear about what we're going to do with the powers that are available to us today or are likely to be with us in the next few years. Too long, politicians have used those sorts of issues as excuses for not showing leadership. I look at things like the Deep Place study, which was done in, in Tredegra, my constituency, 
Google it if you haven't had the opportunity to look at it, where you bring together solutions for clean energy, for social policy, for economic development, and the eradication of poverty. You don't do it in separate uh, silos. You don't give it to separate ministers or, or don't talk to each other. Uh, what you do is you put it together as a single holistic dim, uh, program for a community. And if you do that, then you will have people opening a door and talking about the issues Sorry. which I, I, w I wish people would talk about. Anthony. I have to um, have something to say on climate change. You've got to let the Green Party <laughs> talk about surely, this. Surely not. Thank you for asking. Um, it was talked about on the doorstep a lot, and the question that I was asked a lot was your very question. It was deeply frustrating. The televised debates, the radio, we got more attention than we've ever had before, which was great. We were taken seriously. And then that one topic, you really had to fight to get it in, and then it was usually edited out. It was, and it is the political establishment's fault. Five years ago, everyone was falling over themselves to dress up as the Green Party. You know, we were promised the greenest government yet, ever. And that worked out really well, didn't it? It's, it's crucial. It's the issue of our time. All other issues, social justice, inequality, they're all interlinked, and our policies reflect that. We have three strands running through all our policies. It's we've got to harm, we've got to repair the damage that's been created to our planet by an unfair economic system. We've got to create a more equal society where everyone shares the rewards of that society. And we've got to create, revive democracy so that those first two things come about. It was, I did lots and lots of hustings, as I'm sure everyone else here did. But I did three school hustings and one Woodcraft folk hustings. And they were noticeable because they were the first, the first three questions at all of those events were about climate change, why aren't politicians talking about it, and to go on to what we've strayed on to, does the future generations bill mean anything to me? And I'm on the side of the cynics at the moment. I think we have a Welsh government that can churn out warm words. I hope to be proved wrong. The words are a step in the right direction, but we need to be having these crucial conversations. And I'm so glad you asked it, because if I didn't get asked it from this audience, <laughs> then we, we really do have to give up. Can I, can I just pick up on, on what, was, uh, what Alan was saying about the economic, the social, and the environmental, of course, you know, that, that is key. But, you know, this government isn't utilising the opportunities that they already have to deliver some of that. I mentioned part L regulations, look at retrofitting. You know, retrofitting will deliver jobs because the work of retrofitting those buildings needs to be done. It'll deliver on fuel poverty, so that's the social agenda, and it'll deliver on carbon reduction, so that's your environmental. Those are the three elements of sustainable development, the holy grail of sustainable development. And what we have, of course, are Arbed and uh, Nest and, and a few other schemes, very laudable, but the scale of those schemes is, you know, it's practically negligible in a sense. Um, and if this government tell us that they can find around 1.2 billion pound to build a 12 kilometer stretch of motorway around Newport, then I'm sure it's not beyond the will of this government if they really wanted to do it, to find the two billion pound, maybe over 10, 15 years, that's needed to retrofit the one third of uh, Welsh housing stock that isn't up to standard at the moment. And that's the kind of investment that applied Cymru government would be looking for in terms of delivering on the economic, social, and environmental agenda that this current Labour government is actually failing to do. I mean, you don't look convinced. I never heard him say it when I was a minister, that's why. Uh, you weren't I, listening then, I, 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 I did listen, and I protected, as you know, um, the budgets for all those different schemes yeah, so against that's, that's quite great. significant cuts. But they really um, need to be ramped up. Yeah, I, but l let me say this. I, I, I don't disagree with you on the M4. You know that. I, I wholly oppose mm. the proposals to um, build across the Gwent levels. I don't think that's anywhere close to where any government which claims to have a sustainable transport policy should be. You want to and build I, other roads instead, though? Pardon? You want to build other roads instead? I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't build roads at all. I'm saying that we, we need to build road roads road. where there are no alternatives to doing so. You know, I've made it very clear, and, you know, you tweeted about it. Uh, the, <laughs> amongst other things you've tweeted. Uh, <laughs> that um, I think the clear transport priority for the next Welsh government, wherever the politics of it, should be the South Wales Metro because that is how we're going to have the biggest single impact, both on the uh, alleviation of poverty, the uh, leading to green growth, I hope, and also uh, meeting our climate change targets. But to go back to Clear's um, point on the um, Nest and Arbed schemes, I think, I, I, I think they do a great job for what they do, and I've seen that in my constituency. But what we need to be doing, and what I hope is going to be happening over the next few months, is that the Welsh Government will go out to consultation to reinvent those, pro those yeah. projects and programs 
for the, 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 the next few years. They're both coming to an end at the moment. Um, we've done a great job for what we've done, but I believe we need to be as ambitious as, as, as Lee has outlined. I'm not sure we've got quite the money that perhaps he thinks we have, but to ensure that we're also delivering both the physical retrofitting of homes, but also things like smart metering, more control of, um, of, of energy, which means that people will be able to have a far more sophisticated um, uh, approach to energy efficiency than we've had before. And that's why I think energy efficiency should be a part of a single energy department in the Welsh Government. Okay. Any questions? Further questions? Yeah. Jeremy Smith, R RWE Energy. Um, it's, it's a fairly short question, really, and I think Alan um, has answered it, but I'm not sure everyone else has. And it goes back to the speech that I did earlier today and ended with a question, which is, do you think the time is now right for the Welsh Government to ask for full powers over energy and climate change policy and subsidies? And I think the logical conclusion from that would be, do we need a, a minister in Wales for energy and climate change? Bill Powell. Uh, the answer in, in brief is yes and yes. D yes does anybody, yes does really anybody well? take a different view? Uh, no, I don't. So it's yes and yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have to agree, I'm afraid. I, I would say energy outside nuclear. I would put that qualification in there. I don't think... Oh, we wouldn't have nuclear, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, myself, Lear, and Bill, I think, are quite super strong supporters of nuclear. But oh, he's teasing me now, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. I, I hear your speeches in favour of Wilver. I, I listen to your speeches in favour of Wilver every week, you see, so I can I only conclude. In favor of Wilver, you know, I, can only, I can only conclude you. <laughs> I, I can only conclude. I, have to back on I, I can only conclude that you do uh, support nuclear as strongly as I do. But um, so I don't think we should have nuclear responsibility in Wales. I think that's best retained as a, as a UK, um, uh, as a UK reserve power, where the, that level of expertise lies. But I do believe, I, I, I thought the Smith Commission was mealy-mouthed in, um, in, in their conclusions. Mm. Um, there is no reason why um, uh, any of our natural resources should have a false ceiling placed upon them Absolutely. in the same as energy has. I agreed with Owen Patterson actually over a cup of coffee in Luxembourg nearly two years ago, the devolution of water and sewerage, because there was no reason not to. He suggested, I agreed it, and we got back to mm. Cardiff and London to find out there are but uh, David Jones had um, changed his mind whilst we were in the air. But, uh, you know, there is no reason why um, uh, that level of devolution shouldn't happen. But what we need is a collaboration as well between the UK administrations. And I think that's what we're missing at the moment. And I, this is one of the great fears I have with the election of the, 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 this sort of Conservative government. We talk about devolution in terms of powers being taken from London and given to Cardiff, uh, Edinburgh, uh, Belfast and what have you. And, but what I see as well is England r moving out of multicultural country agreements. They've done it in education, and they've done it to some extent in some parts of agriculture and, and environmental policy. And my concern is that you will have uh, 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 an English government sitting as a UK government arguing for policies <coughs> that are England policies in international agreements. I've had rows and rows and rows about the European aspect where you have a UK minister representing an English government. And I think that's an absolute tragedy. It shouldn't happen. And we need to be very, very clear. Not only do we have the powers here in Wales, which we require in order to deliver, uh, you know, what I believe would be a, 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 a powerful home rule parliament here, but also um, then that we have a means of ensuring that we have a UK policy that reflects the diversity of opinion within the United Kingdom. So that when we have a UK minister, I hope with a Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish minister as well, attending the um, Paris negotiations, that there's a United Kingdom line mm -hmm. which goes beyond simply, I mm -hmm. think, with some, with somewhat yeah. dismal politics and prejudices of uh, gentlemen's clubs in St. James's, which seems mm -hmm. largely to dictate the policy of this government. Mm -hmm. Just to take you back to the question of powers, because the Silk Commission, which the Labour Party mm. said they'd have implemented had they won, committed to a figure of 350 megawatts for devolution of power, which, as I understand it, was Jane Davidson's suggestion within the Silk Commission to allow a project the size of the uh, Swansea uh, Bay Lagoon to be, to be decided at the Welsh level. But, of course, the 
the other lagoons, the, the Cardiff lagoons, significantly bigger than that. So is there a case now to revise that figure upwards, or is that going to be stuck with because it was in the Silk Commission? I didn't think that uh, number had any relevance in the first place. No. Um, Still, the, it is the number, though, isn't it? It is a number, but um, my, my, I, I suppose I can say this now, but my, my, the, the, the proposal I made at the time of the Silk Commission um, I can't remember if it went into Welsh Government submission or not now, but certainly the submission I made was that there shouldn't be an upper limit because outside of nuclear, um, the, we should be able to determine um, what and how we generate renewable energy, particularly from um, our natural resources ourselves. And I saw no role. I see a collaboration role with our friends ac across Offers Dyke, not a role of decision taking and decision making on our behalf. Okay, we've only got 10 minutes left, so if you have questions, now really is the time to, uh, to pause them. There is, can I just ask you all about the planning bill just passed uh, this week and, and the impact that might make to implementing renewable energy schemes in Wales? B bill Powell. I think the, the planning bill, or planning act now, will, will actually deliver some significant uh, improvements uh, for uh, the likes of, uh, of the folk that we've got gathered in the room today, uh, particularly in terms of the, the power uh, that uh, is now available to developers uh, if they uh, feel that they are not being uh, dealt with uh, appropriately and if there's uh, evidence of shortcomings in, in, a, in a, a planning authority that is seen to be failing, that that can be brought forward. Um, a, number of, uh, a number of issues uh, that will streamline things. Um, there, there are elements of an over-centralization uh, that I think would have been that would have been usefully mitigated by a third-party right of appeal in certain limited circumstances, and, and I, uh, alongside Clea and, uh, and others, sought to, to bring that forward. But I think on balance, we're, we are looking at a, a planning system that should be better placed to deliver, but crucially, uh, it's going to be the next tier down in terms of the, the technical advice that sits underneath the legislation, which is going to be critical, and that we need to watch very, very carefully. Here. Yeah, I think um, the unfortunate thing about the planning bill, as it was, uh, was that it actually moved power up the chain. Uh, it took key decisions further away from those communities that are directly affected by many of those decisions. Now, that's not to say that we need a system that allows for developments of national significance, et cetera, to be made at another level, because obviously there will be a national interest for, for, for many of those developments. Um, but the, the key thing for me, uh, or one of the key things uh, coming from the planning bill now, is the national development framework that's proposed. Um, it can be one of two things. It can be another Wales spatial plan, which I hope it's not, uh, because that, uh, I think, just sort of disappeared to irrelevance. Um, or it can be a, a much more dynamic uh, framework that actually changes um, the, um, the landscape in terms of the potential for energy projects and renewables and gives a strong political lead if you like, about what the direction of travel is. Now, I am still rather unclear as to what the, frame, the, the NDF will look like, uh, because whilst you'd expect it to be identifying Energy Island and sort of certain areas and uh, enterprise zones and you know, all of that kind of thing, um, there was provision in the bill uh, around planning blight. There was provision in the bill around compulsory purchase, mm. uh, which makes you think that actually this could be a very, very specific and very localised uh, framework as well. So we wait to see you know, where we go with that one, but I think it does offer huge potential uh, because we see, for example, you know, what, what they've done in Scotland uh, and the framework that they've developed there, mm. uh, and I think it could set out uh, huge potential for, for the energy uh, sector in Wales and renewables particularly. And it will probably mean that we review TAN 8 as well. Anthony. Mm. I think the proof will be mm. in the implementation. I mean, some good moves in some good directions. I agree, I don't like decisions going higher up the chain, especially for local community local community projects. Um, as was touched on, it's the legal advice. Again, go, going back to my earlier cynicism, is it just warm words or are we actually going to see this translated into practical, supportive measures? And I do hope so, and I think broadly it's a step in the right direction. Uh, Alan, you alluded earlier to ministers not talking to each other. Uh, you also mentioned the change in responsibility for energy going into uh, Edwina Hart, who doesn't have a reputation for talking to people, but she has a reputation for getting things done. But you also mentioned that the slight obfuscation in the 
statement of energy being pulled together, but in fact, in the reality, the way government works, that, that's not happening. Do, what do you, do you think the move into putting energy with economic development is something uh, which people in the room should be encouraged by? Well, I'm certainly not encouraged by where you sum up my remarks sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me which bits I, I got I wrong. Think you, you get me into even more trouble than I can get myself into. But <laughs> can, can I say, in terms of, to, to answer your, your question directly about planning, uh, um, I think the work of NRW, I think the work that Emir Roberts has done, I spoke to him earlier, I don't know if you still here, Emir, but um, I, I, I think the work that NRW have done in actually clarifying um, a lot of the permitting and consenting arrangements has made a huge difference already in terms of planning. I know not everybody might see that at the moment, but certainly the culture mm -hmm. change and the ability now of NRW to actually work uh, more effectively, I think, is, is something which will stand us in good stead in the future. Um, I'm not as pessimistic as others about um, the Planning Act. I think it will provide a good balance between new strengthened local authorities um, the, the one thing I would say about it, which I did, um, uh, which I was, which did disappoint me, was that um, planning was uh, not taken from national parks and given uh, to local authorities. I think that would have clarified um, arrangements in a way w which would have been beneficial. But um, certainly, I hope that the new planning authorities, which emerged from this seemingly endless period of local government reorganisation reform that we, I seem to have lived in for most of my life at the moment. But it, it will provide both certainty and consistency and clarity across the face of a country. You know, one of the things which I think really frustrates people is if they see a project very similar to their own being given consent and permission, you know, in another authority, yet they've been waiting five years in, in their own authority. Mm. That's both unfair and wrong. And we need to clarify those sorts of arrangements. We need to see a much greater presumption in favor of renewables um, and, and renewable energy production particularly on a community level, not simply on an individual business base, but on a community level. I can think of numerous communities who have really been let down by, um, by the system of governance, not just uh, local authorities, who have been uh, supportive of the, was it the Annie for All projects and have been in, in a position whereby enormous amounts of work and effort and time have been invested only for enormous amounts of time, work and effort to be invested by another arm of government preventing that happening. And we've really got to move away from that. So that is how I will judge the Planning Act in years to come. I don't share the cynicism of others on the panel about it. Yeah. My question on energy and economic development coming together? Uh, being, yeah. being devolved. Energy coming into a Dwina Hearts department. I, I, Thank you, Hugh. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I said to, in answer to an earlier question, I would see energy and climate change as being a department in its own right, but I, I wouldn't necessarily criticize movement of, of energy into, into the economic portfolio. My concern is that we have a focus on energy and its part in the community of Wales and in addressing issues around climate change. And I think that's got to be something which has got to be departmental. I don't think it works if it's not a departmental responsibility. Okay, uh, time is against us, so just, just to finish, uh, just a qu quick question to you. A year from now, we'll be reflecting on the assembly election results. Um, back to the first question we had about climate change being mentioned, and the question on, let's move away from warm words to targets. Will you be arguing for a strong emphasis in your party's manifesto, both on putting climate change as a prominent issue, mm. and in putting targets in your manifestos, Bill Power? Mm. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lee. Uh, we certainly will be uh, looking to put uh, climate change uh, central uh, to, to our manifesto and, and to have uh, uh, deliverable objectives that we can be judged um, by during the, the lifetime of uh, that assembly, whatever numbers uh, we are given by the electorate uh, next May, and that is obviously a matter of that is well beyond our current uh, control. Uh, another thing that we shall be looking at is, uh, is to promote uh, the localization of the grid uh, in, in certain circumstances, because Ofgem is doing some really interesting work on unconventional markets at the moment. And I think that potentially, and there's some, some excellent work done uh, in particularly in Baden-Württemberg, in, 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 uh, in, in Germany and, and elsewhere, and the um, Environment Sustainability Committee is recently be doing a piece of work which, which is ongoing on energy vendor. And we 
as a party are looking seriously at that and the former Labour MP Alan Simpson is doing a lot of interesting work mm -hmm. around that agenda and we're hoping to be building some of the key points from that into our manifesto but obviously that's still at the uh, planning stage just now. Okay, Anthony, a fairly easy question for you. Um, yeah, climate change will be, will be there. It'll be page one. <laughs> That's reassuring. <laughs> it'll, be the core, it'll be the core of our policies, as I said, those three strands. It runs through everything we do. It will be there in many ways. There will be targets, but we deal, we always have done, maybe to our electoral disadvantage, but we deal in the long term. Our targets are for 2030, 2050. We're talking about, you know, we share the aims of zero carbon Britain. We're aiming for that kind of society. Absolutely. So much, much longer term targets. The other thing that will differentiate it in terms of energy and what we're proposing to the Welsh electorate next year is ours will be the only one that unequivocally has no room for nuclear in a future energy mix. We are absolutely against nuclear. We do not see a role for it. As I explained earlier, it is not economic, it is dirty, it is dangerous. We shouldn't be thinking of it. That will be one of the things we will be pushing quite hard, that and fracking. And I think climate change will be a bigger issue in a year's time almost in a yeah. way, like lots of other issues, some social justice issues will as well, just as a reaction to yeah. what's coming in the next Absolutely. 12 months. Absolutely. Okay, Alan, final word. I feel like we could be starting coalition negotiations. <laughs> 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 uh, be careful. Um, look, you know, what, what I hope, um, what, what I hope we'll be able to achieve in Blaenau Gwent as a constituency member, assuming I haven't thrown away my majority in the next uh, 12 months, uh, is to take a holistic approach to what we're seeking to achieve for our communities and uh, to move away from simply producing endless strategies to say to having a very much a, pro a proposition to the electorate is that we will do the following and we will try to achieve a following within the next five years or whatever time scale that was given to us. But what I would like to see us doing is uh, asking the question about what is government for and what should government be doing. And if you take economic policy uh, as an example, um, the role of, of government in, in, in investing in, in an economy has to be to deliver what the market can't deliver or won't deliver itself. So it has to be investment in, um, in, in green technologies, in clean technologies, in green energy. We have to create the environment in which investments can take place and we have to do that pro proactively. We have to skew green growth towards the uh, alleviation and eradication of poverty. You know, if anywhere in the country understands the price of mm -hmm. energy, which Bill referred mm -hmm. to in his first answer, then it's, it's blind I went. Mm -hmm. Uh, we understand that the Industrial Revolution was born in the heads of our valleys, and what we have to ensure is, is that the next Industrial Revolution, which we're experiencing at the moment, is also um, there in the heads of our valleys. And I'm not, and I don't share the hopelessness. I share the, you know, the only thing more depressing the election result is the Labour leadership election that's taking place now. Don't, don't get me it. wrong. You said it. Don't, don't get me wrong about that. But I, I don't share the hopelessness and the helplessness of others on this panel. I believe that we can actually use what powers and what uh, and the people we have in order to change our communities for the better. And I hope that in Blind Eye Gwent, we can certainly do that. And that the Labour Manifesto will be a manifesto about the people of Wales and how we can change our lives and change our futures. And bringing together climate change, not simply as a chapter one of a first page of a second page, but as a fundamental part of every aspect of our policy portfolio and our policy offer. I have a copy of the manifesto. Great. Thank you very much. Just a very brief word about um, what the IWA is going to be doing all over this, because we've decided to make um, a, a vision for uh, a, um, a Wales which was self-sufficient in renewable energy, one of our key priorities over the next 18 months. And we uh, published a report on the economy recently that Jerry Holtham authored, which is on our website, free to download, which had a detailed chapter by Professor Gareth Wynne-Jones on this uh, ambition. And we're now pulling together a group of experts to try and drill down to see what the practicalities are for delivering that. And we hope to be doing that over the coming months. So if you're not already a member of the IWA, now is a good time to, to join up and help us to deliver that uh, vision, because uh, we are a charity and we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, you hopefully you'll get copies of our magazine uh, as you leave. Um, so I'd be grateful for your help on that, but please uh, thank the panel, and I'll just hand back to David. Thank you. Thanks very much. I won't take up more than two minutes of your time. Just to uh, reiterate uh, Lee's uh, request, consider membership of the IWA. We are corporate members uh, ourselves, and it's a very worthwhile institution. 
uh, just as long as you've joined us first, because uh, the, uh, the industry is only as strong as the membership, and we rely on your support for events and membership in order to create the kind of spaces that we've had for discussion today. Um, interested actually to see the panel, maybe they've had a sneak peek at our draft manifesto for 2016 with all the talk of uh, Minister for Energy and Climate Change, because that's certainly one of the things that uh, we'll be asking for. And on that, I think that uh, we'll be looking for wider engagement with a whole range of um, NGOs and private sector organizations to try and build up some kind of combined voice for what we would expect from the political parties uh, for next year. Um, I'll just finish with uh, thanks to our sponsors and for everybody who's attended uh, and the exhibitors today. Uh, we will have some further events coming up later this year. We'll be launching our manifesto with, uh, in partnership with Invict, who sponsored us here to, uh, today and yesterday. Uh, we have um, an event in June, which will be uh, trying to replicate the success of Paris Wind Farm supporters. So if you're interested, if you know people in, uh, in West uh, Wales who are interested in trying to emulate their success, let us know and we'll pass on the details of that event, 13th of June in Aberystwyth. We have Smart Energy Wales, which has the support of Welsh Government um, and Arab and British Gas so far. That's being held on the 16th of September in Cardiff. And then uh, the social highlight of our calendar is the Wales Green Energy Awards, which is being held in November this year. So details of all of those will be available on our website. And it just remains for me to once again ask you to thank everybody who's contributed today and to wish you all a very safe uh, journey back home. And we'll see you again uh, next year at the very latest. Thanks very much. Thank